All right, so thanks for being here. Um, Becca and I are going to try to explore uh, a couple of the, the legacy and thoughts and practice and surprising correspondences between a couple of figures dear to our hearts in order to see, uh, I, I think the intuition behind what we're hoping to do is to see if there's something similar going on in what Hildegard of Bingen in the 12th century and J.R.R. Tolkien in the 20th century were experiencing, articulating, and the ways in which they then sought to respond to what it was they were experiencing and articulating in these diverse visionary modes. And it's, it's kind of a fascinating set of resonances <coughs> that I don't think either of us had thought about very seriously until just recently. So there's something exploratory and experimental in what we're hoping to do. At the very least, you'll get exposed to two fantastically fascinating figures. Um, and I'm eager to see what comes from it. Yes. So, so I'll get started. Uh, and ooh, Let me see, where did my little clicker go? Here we go. So I want to start by talking to you about Hildegard of Bingen, who's one of my favorite... Uh, one of my favorite figures from pre-modernity, Hildegard was one of the most remarkable and gifted individuals in the midst of an extraordinarily remarkable period of time that we call the 12th century. The 12th century, if you know anything about it, uh, is the time of the birth of Chartres Cathedral, the birth of the great cathedral schools, the foundations of the university are laid during that period. There is, uh, during the 12th century, new translations of Aristotle are coming into Europe uh, from the Islamic worlds, presenting a new cosmology. At the same time, there's a, a, um, a re-urbanization of medieval Europe that's happening as the cities begin to accumulate wealth and power and a, the possibility of a new middle class. It's the century of Dominic and Francis, if you know about the Dominican and the Franciscan orders. It's a time of saints and scholars and so forth. But it's also... Um, it was also the time of Hildegard uh, of Bingen. And Hildegard is born during this, this remarkable time, and she's the tenth child in a family, uh, a pious family. For, and for pious families in the 12th century, oftentimes your tenth child was given as a tithe uh, to the church. So before Hildegard was even born, they knew that Hildegard was going to go away and live at a convent because she's the tenth child and you give her away. Uh, and she was set apart in that sense from birth but she was also set apart from birth, not only uh, because she came from a pious family, but also because of this extraordinary gifting that seemed to be present in her from even a young age. As young as four, she was having clairvoyant experiences that were freaking out uh, her caregivers. Uh, at one point, she, she's walking with one of her caregivers, um, her sort of nurse, and she points out to her, uh, a, a, uh, I think it was a sheep, it was either a sheep or a goat, that was pregnant, and, and she described what the baby was going to be, what the foal was going to be, and when it would be born, and described the pattern that it was going to be born with. And then a couple days later, this thing was born, and it had the exact pattern that Hildegard, the four-year-old Hildegard, had described to her caregiver, which freaked the caregiver out, uh, and began a series of events in Hildegard's life that often ended with people around her being freaked out by the uncanny insight and knowledge that she seemed to have that went above and beyond what ordinary knowledge should have allowed her. So to her contemporaries, Hildegard ex eventually became extraordinarily famous as, uh, and, and was known for being what they called the Sibyl of the Rhine. A Sibyl is a kind of prophetess. Uh, she lived in the Rhineland Valley in the 12th century, and so she was regarded by those around her as actually a prophetess. This is at a time when, uh, when the figure of a woman speaking with that kind of authority was actually quite unusual. Uh, when we look at the great flowering of medieval women's Christian mysticism, we look really to the late 13th and into the 14th century. At that time, there's just an explosion of women's mysticism and, and the finding of a new female voice for the expression of mystical and spiritual truths. Hildegard's speaking 150 years before that and is speaking with such tremendous authority and clarity that popes, princes, bishops, kings, ordinary people all came to her, asked for her guidance, and listened to her correction. I mean, it's extraordinary. Hildegard calls out 
the most famous spiritual guide of her day, Bernard of Clairvaux, recognized as maybe the greatest living spiritual teacher in the 12th century, the maker of popes. Bernard's students became popes. Bernard's <coughs> approval could make or break someone's career and influence. Uh, and Hildegard, uh, Bernard famously, I, I love a lot of what Bernard writes, writes some beautiful texts, but uh, I also have my issues with Bernard. At one point he decides to you know, preach the, the first crusade, which the crusades began about three years before Hildegard was born. And, Jerusalem fell a couple years after, when, when she was about two years old, uh, fell to the Crusaders, and then there was fighting going on for the next century, and Bernard of Clairvaux was out, often out there preaching that, and the Knights Templar were formed out of this as a kind of combination of Cistercianism and, and the, uh, the call of knights to the Crusades. But Hildegard is willing to challenge that, and to challenge that in the name of a, a, a divine authority that she spoke with, and she would challenge popes about their decisions, and and Bizarrely, people would listen to her, and her fame grew and grew. Now, I tell, all, I tell you all of that just to give you a sense of who she was. In addition to having this kind of divine authority, Hildegard wrote uh, a number of books. She penned 10 books in her lifetime, and these books cover everything from holistic healing and health and, and women's health and medicine and herbalism to cosmology, science, uh, the nature of plants, to fantastic visionary texts of theology, philosophy, and spirituality. Uh, and what I want to talk about today is really the culmination of that, of her visionary text. It's a, the third work of a trilogy she wrote, all of which are exegese, ex, uh, exegeses of Hildegard's remarkable visions. And so this work is called the Liber Divinorum Operarum, the Book of Divine Works. Before I talk about that, though, uh, I want to say one last thing about the 12th century, because it, from our standpoint, you know, nine centuries later, it might seem like the 12th century was an age of enchantment, uh, or uh, it might seem kind of, um, what's the word? Let's, well, let's say pokey and medieval. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the 12th century was an age of extraordinary conflict and crisis at the same time. The, you know, while Chartres is going up, and while the cathedral schools are being born, you have this conflict brewing with the, with the Crusades. And uh, this is also the century in which, if you know your British history at all, uh, St. Thomas Becket is martyred in, in, in the, the center of Canterbury Cathedral. His throat is slit by agents of the king. The most powerful sort of voice for church reform is murdered by the king in the midst of the cathedral. So there's, there's these kind of political intrigue and civil war brewing all around it. Hildegard's very own archbishop, the Archbishop of Mance, and later on she gets in great trouble with the prelates of Mance. Uh, her own archbishop raised taxes it, to this extreme rate on the people of uh, his, his bishopric in order to raise funds to rally an army against the pope. Uh, and then in the, mo the big mob, sort of mob riots that took place because taxes had been raised so high, the archbishop ends up being murdered by the, the people of her, the very town that Hildegard lived in. So if you think we live in a time of chaos, we do. <laughs> but Hildegard lived in a time of chaos too, a time in which people anticipated a world ending, and maybe a new world being born. Uh, and I think that's important to bear in mind when thinking about a figure like her, because I think part of what's going on in her life is in the midst of all of this chaos, in the midst of all of this turbulence and uncertainty, uh, something was born through her own creative, prophetic, visionary, and intellectual forces. OK, enough about the sort of background. Let's get into talking more about Hildegard's work. So here's a, a picture of Hildegard receiving inspiration. One of the fascinating things about Hildegard's visions is in her own lifetime, they were put into these extraordinary pieces of art that maybe you've seen. Uh, Hildegard's one of the few figures from the 12th century, or the 13th or the 14th for that matter, that you might be familiar with their artwork, either their music or their illustrations. And even if you didn't know them by name, it's very likely that you've seen some of them. Uh, Hildegard described the way she received her visions as uh, a kind of being overcome by the living light. Let's see if I can, oh, shoot. I did that thing again. Oh, man. Excuse me. I 
keep pushing the wrong button on this, and then it won't work. So Hildegard says, the things that I write are those that I see and hear in my vision, with no words of my own added. And these are expressed in unpolished Latin, for that is the way I hear them in my vision, since I am not taught in the vision to write the way philosophers do. This is one of the things you find women mystics saying throughout the medieval period. They always claim that they haven't been taught, that they've been untutored. It doesn't mean that they haven't learned. Hildegard had extremely learned monks and uh, teachers around her from whom she seemed to have access to a tremendous library of materials, but she wasn't schooled in a formal system. And by proclaiming her being, her being untaught, it was both a bid to authority and a protection from any sort of casual errors that you might get called out about. So this is a trope you see again and again in these, these women. Uh, but then she says, moreover, the words I see and hear in the vision are not like the words of human speech, but they're like a blazing flame and a cloud that moves through clear air. That's what you see there. It's the blazing flame and the cloud that's moving into her mind. They're like a blazing flame and a cloud that moves through clear air. I can by no means grasp the form of this light any more than I can stare fully into the sun. So she's describing the, the visions that you're going to see in a couple minutes. They're, they're coming to her in something like a light that's overshadowing her, that's like a flame or a light, not something that she looks directly at, but something that she looks alongside of. It's a feeling of a presence of light in which something will be illuminated. She says other times, though not so often, she has another kind of vision. I see another light in that light. So she's out describing seeing a second light inside that first light. So the first light is that which by which things are illumined. It's like a flashlight shining on something in which her pictures appear. And then there's a second light uh, that she sees inside that illumination, and she calls that the living light. But I'm even less able to explain how I see this light than I am the other one. Suffice it to say that when I do see it, all my sorrow and pain vanish. She was racked by pain and headaches and uh, sort of deep, uh, prolonged illnesses throughout her life. All my sorrow and pain vanish from my memory, and I become more like a young girl than an old woman. And here's the description of uh, the reception of one of her first powerful set of visionary sequences. It came to pass in the 1141st year of the incarnation of Jesus Christ, Son of God, when I was 42. So for those of you, I'm turning 45 in a couple days, so I missed this date. But for those of you who still have some ways to go, she doesn't have her great visions that begin her great theological cycle until in her 40s. Hurrah. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're on a uh, supposition. <laughs> the heavens were opened and the blinding light of exceptional brilliance flowed through my entire brain. And so it kindled my whole heart and breast like a flame, not burning, but warming. She's picturing herself there almost, if you know your, if you know your sort of religious iconography, she's picturing herself almost like the bush that Moses saw that was, that was inflamed but not consumed. She herself is becoming the, the place in which the flame is burning but not consuming. The light is present. And suddenly I understood the meaning of the exposition of the books, that is to say of the Psalter and the Evangelists and the other Catholic books of the Old and New Testaments. What happens is she suddenly feels like she, she knows. She, doesn't, she hasn't been taught how to do an exegesis. She hasn't been taught how to preach but she suddenly knows the meaning of these texts. And powerfully, uh, unprecedentedly for a woman in her age, Hildegard was given permission to preach, not just to her convents. She had a, number, she had a couple of convents that she was abbess over. She, she would naturally have preached to them. But she was given permission to preach all throughout Germany, all throughout Europe. And she would go on these preaching tours, preaching to men, uh, preaching to monks, preaching to priests, which is extraordinarily unusual at the time. Uh, she writes, one of the, she writes two of the only sort of extant theological uh, commentaries, scriptural commentaries that we have on, uh, written in the hand of a woman for a, for a couple hundred years. Uh, they, Hildegard writes a full commentary on the, the prologue of the Gospel of John and a full commentary on what's called the hexameron, the, the, the six days of Genesis and the story of creation. She writes this whole commentary on it. Uh, and there's nothing like that that appears in any other... Uh, anywhere else during the Middle Ages. Okay, last, last little bit about her visions. Finally, in the time that followed, I saw a mystic and wondrous vision, such that my insides were convulsed. This is her describing 
the origin of the images I'm about to show you, such that my insult, insides were convulsed and my body's power of sensation was extinguished because my knowledge was transmuted to another mode, as if I did not know myself. This is different from the others she usually receives. Usually she doesn't find herself ecstatic. That is, she usually doesn't find herself taking leave of a sense of her own being, uh, of her own identity, of her own presence. Whereas this one is a kind of ecstasy, an even more intense version of the vision. And from God's inspiration, as it were, drops of sweet rain splashed into my soul's knowledge, just as the Holy Spirit filled John the Evangelist when, it should say, when he sucked supremely deep revelation from the breast of Jesus. Uh, this gender bending is common in Hildegard, where you get, uh, you'll get images of the divine and the human uh, and the, the, the male Christ will become a female figure or an androgynous figure, or you'll get these images of, of Christ suckling, uh, suckling people at his own breast, uh, uh, becoming both mother and son uh, at the same time. Uh, when his understanding was touched so deeply by holy divinity, this is John, that he revealed hidden mysteries and works, saying, in the beginning was the word. Now, Hildegard's comparing herself there to... John the Evangelist, the author of the Gospel of John, the author of the Book of Revelation, uh, at least as Hildegard thought. Uh, so she's, she's not only describing something that she thinks happened in the past, but she's accumulating a tremendous bid for authority on her part. She's like John the Evangelist, and her visions are akin to that. And this is the vision she saw. And in this vision, she sees uh, this figure which she identifies as caritas, which means love. It's also later identified as a kind of Sophia figure, sapientia. Later in the sequence, divine wisdom herself will appear. Uh, it's somewhat associated with Christ, but it's clearly a female figure. Uh, it's all fiery red. It has these wings coming out of it. It has the head of a, a, a sort of gray-bearded head of a traditional figure of God the Father overhead. Uh, and then, but it sits on top of the crown of Sapientia, Sophia, uh, who treads on the, the body of a serpent. So, Hildegard describes, uh, it's a little bit closer, up on the vision. And Hildegard then hears this voice speak. Now what I want to do is I want to lead you, uh, let's see, how are we doing for time? I want to lead you quickly through sort of what this voice says and the picture it unfolds to her through sequences of visions of an ordered creation and then introduce Hildegard's wrestling with the challenge of shadow in the midst of an ordered and enchanted creation in order to lead to sort of the, the, the way she wraps that up, which I think has powerful parallels with what Becca is going to tell us about Tolkien's own vision. So here's what it begins to say. I am the supreme and fiery force who sets all living sparks alight and breathes forth no mortal things, but judges them as they are. I am the supreme and fiery force flying around the circling circlet with my upper wings with wisdom. I've ordered all things rightly. Wisdom there being sapientia. But I am also the fiery life of the essence of divinity. I flame above the beauty of the fields, and I shine in the waters, and I burn in the sun, the moon, and the stars. With the airy wind, I quicken all things with some invisible life that sustains them all. For the air lives in veridity. The, 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 the word there is veriditas. It's, it's a word she made up. It means, it's from the Latin word for green, but it means like greenness. It's not a word that people use otherwise, but she's invented this in order to talk about the effect of this secret fire, this flame of divinity that is both spiritual and the inner heart of all physical creation, the inner heart of all physical things. In Hildegard's world, the, the most profound sense you get from spending time with Hildegard's visionary literature is the non-discontinuity between the moral or the, the, the spiritual, the psychic, and the physical, the natural, the cosmological. The two are always blending into one another. Winds are suffused with virtue and, and, uh, and, and inner sense to them. I mean, I feel this way, maybe you feel this way sometimes. When that wind blew in yesterday, did any of you feel that? Uh, were you present for that wind that descended on the, 
the North Bay or, or the Bay Area yesterday. Whenever I'm present in a, that kind of a wind, I just feel unsettled inside. I, I, it's not something that, that calms me. It's a, it's a kind of turbulent wind, and my insides feel turbulent. It's different than a sort of warm wind that blows up from the south uh, you know, that, that oftentimes leads me to feel more centered. And Hildegard believed that absolutely literally. She believed that those winds had different qualities to them, different characteristics. I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> so then she says, when the moon has waned, it's, it is rekindled by the sunlight to live as if anew, and the stars shine bright as if by living in their own light. But this light that they all live with comes from this divine fire, this holy fire, this secret fire, as Tolkien would call it. I have established, too, the pillars that contain the whole circle of the earth, the winds, Therefore, the fiery for I, the fiery force, lie hidden within these things, and they burn because of me. Just as breath continually moves a human being, and a flickering flame exists within the fire. All these things. It, she's picturing everything. Everything that everything that is is alive. Even the things that seem not to be alive have a hidden life inside of them. If you could see rightly, you'd see this kind of flickering flame inside everything. And she. She wants to lead you into the place where you can have a vision of that. I am also rationality, possessing the breath of the resounding word through which every created thing was made, and into all these things I blew so that none of them is mortal in its nature, because I am life. None of them is dead in its nature. It's what she means by the word mortal there. Nothing is dead in its nature, because it comes from life. Everything that comes from life issues as life. Okay, so then she moves from that earlier vision, right? It, it begins to expand. It's like, a, it's, it's like a video in her mind, and it opens up, and the heart of wisdom, sapientia, caritas, opens up, and she then sees the human being in the midst of it. Uh, uh, that's just to tell you that north, south, east, and west are different on a picture like this than usual, but we don't need to get into that. Um, so... The human being is in the midst of it, and it's surrounded by these, these figures you can see here, that, these sort of animal heads. Uh, and outside of the animal heads, are plant, there's seven planets, and then there's 16 great stars and a series of lesser stars. And from the animal heads, which represent forces, she, she often describes them as winds, but she means kind of like something like cosmic winds that are blowing moral forces, moral not in the sense of just good, bad, but moral in the sense of virtues, of strength, of courage, of fear, of, uh, uh, of, of creativity, all of these sort of various qualities of inner life are being born by this complex circulation of cosmic energies that she describes as cosmic winds in the midst of this cosmic wheel, at the center of which is the human being. Not because the human being is just simply the best of all things. I'll describe a little bit later what she, why she thinks the human being is at the center, but the human being is at the center as receiving all of these energies, all of these cosmic, planetary, uh, and natural energies. In the next vision, it opens up more fully, and as she exegetes this vision, she'll describe, those of you who were in my class, we did this in, in a lot of detail, she describes in extraordinary detail all the sort of resemblances between the inner and the outer, all the world of correspondences. Some of them seem really contrived. Some of them seem really illuminating. But it's, for her, it's all this sort of elaborate detail of a world mirroring itself and the, the, these mirrorings of ecological and cosmological and moral and spiritual relationships just cascade upon one another. And then in the next vision, you can see this is already divided by the human being. The circle already divides it into four, right? And then in the next vision the most important of this sequence, she gets to this. And in this last vision, she's picturing the entirety of creation as this ordered whole. And it ends in this fantastic mandala, right? You can understand why Jung liked, liked studying these visions. Uh, and the human being is no longer, this is, this is, this is after she's, she's centered even more deeply onto the human in this picture, right? So it's almost like we've gone into the heart of that divine, fiery, wisdom figure, seeing the microcosm of the human being as the recapitulation of the macrocosm in it, gone deeper into it, and then when we go deeper into it, we discover the entire sequence of life on Earth divided into the four seasons, divided into 
people working with the surrounding world. And, and the whole exegesis of this vision four for Hildegard involves her going into this deep um, articulation of the way that human beings live and work with the natural world. So it's not just a question of dwelling in the natural world, but we work with the natural world, right? You see especially the sort of cultivation and farming, but also the times for rest and recuperation. All right, so now I want to read you a little bit about what she says about this. So, this leads to Hildegard's, as, she's, as she describes this vision and goes through this fantastic set of cosmological symbols. I mean, she goes really in detail. She starts talking about like what the, what the eyebrows of the human being, how they correspond to parts of the cosmos, uh, what the teeth symbolize and how they're related. Every little bit of you is related to this cosmological aspect, which is then related to this theological or moral aspect. And then it leads her finally to introduce the words she began with. Remember when she had her vision, she said, I was led to understand the meaning of all things by the same light that led John to write, in the beginning was the word. And then she goes back to that passage, in the beginning was the word. Uh, and she begins to do an exegesis of that first chapter of the Gospel of John that tells the story of the incarnation of God in the human being. And this is what she says. She stops writing. All of this she's been writing in her own voice, talking as a prophetess, but talking about what's going on in all of these visions that were shown to her by God. She's writing as sort of an exegesis. Uh, she's writing as a description of what her seeing showed her. And now suddenly her voice switches and she speaks again in the first person for divinity. She says, I am in myself the day. I came not from the sun, but the sun was set alight from me. I am also reason which took its sound from no one else, but from which all rationality breathes. To behold my face, therefore, I created mirrors in which I consider all the never falling wonders of my antiquity. The mirrors I made to sing together in praise. For mine is the voice of thunder with which I move the whole circle of the earth with the living sounds of all creatures. I, the ancient of days, make them, for through my word, which without beginning ever was and is in me, I bade a great brightness to come forth, and with it countless sparks. These are the angels. So she's now describing the birth of all things before any of this was, as the birth of this great sort of choir of singing angels, the mirrors of divinity. If, if, if light and spark and life and flame are at the heart of her picture of sort of cosmological emergence, uh, then the mirrors are the initial reduplication of that. And they duplicate it in a kind of song, in a kind of harmony, right? She goes on to describe the way then that the entirety of creation is a kind of play of the hidden and the manifest. The way that all of these sort of invisible powers, these invisible mirrors are hidden throughout everything, but manifest in them if you know how to reach them, if you know how to read them. And the specific way in which one knows how to read them or learns to read them is through the use of the human soul. The soul for her is the capacity to receive those mirrors and to re-articulate them. This is going to become really important in just a second. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to where it gets dismal. Uh, so we move from this picture of sort of pastoral human co-belonging with the earth. She says at one point, there is no human without creation. And there is no creation. There's, there are no creatures without the human being. It's this reciprocal uh, mutual, mutuality to both of them. And for the human being for her doesn't just mean the human being as kind of the species that evolved on Earth uh, through a certain history over the course of a couple million years. She means the human being as the being that has within itself, unites within itself, both spirituality, which she calls rationality, uh, the capacity to be reflexive 
to name, uh, to consciously name, not just to articulate, not just to encounter, but to recognize, to, to give a name to another thing. She has this wonderful part where she says, uh, everything that's alive has a name, but nothing that is dead has a name, for when it dies, its name departs from it. Uh, and what she means there by name is the kind of intelligibility that a living <laughs> organism has. That a living organism has a kind of autopoetic system. It holds itself in a certain integrity. Uh, and that capacity to hold itself in a certain integrity, not held in integrity from just outside, but that inner integrity is what allows something to have a name on Hildegard's, uh, on Hildegard's understanding. But that can depart. But the human being has the capacity to recognize those names and to bestow those names, to recognize intelligibility, integrity in things, and to speak those names. And, and so there's this really sort of lovely picture, but it's followed then by this second great vision. And this second great vision gets quite dark quite quickly. And this vision, Hildegard moves from seeing the earth, she moves from seeing the earth this way to seeing the earth this way. And this is a vision that shifts from the way in which things were created as Hildegard sees it, the way in which ideally they would belong together to the way in which we find ourselves in the midst of it. Uh, and she says, all human life, all of our experience on Earth, this is, this is apparently the Earth, uh, but all human experience... Oh, no. We have a laser on us. I'm, I'm like a superhero with a laser. Um, so, I won't even try to reach it, but you can see the middle... The middle three stacks. All human experience is inside those, those red, blue, and sort of dark green stacks. That's effectively Middle Earth. That's where our lives take place. Uh, but we're surrounded by these other parts of Earth. And this is, this, these are the, these ones on the top and the bottom are the realms of purgatory. And Hildegard describes this quite literally. She means, she says that Purgatory, the, the kind of monsters, the toxic fumes, the, the pestilence that dwells in these realms of purgatory that are separated from Middle Earth where normal human life takes place by great mountains, they're created by our injustice, our moral failings, our, our, our um, brutality to one another. They actually, she says at one point, the elements uh, live with one another and live with us in harmony except when we do injustice. When we do injustice, the elements go, th this, this blending of the moral and the physical is so strong for her that she actually sees it at, at that level of crossing. When we, when we behave wrongly, when we behave unjustly to one another, the elements themselves take their, uh, not their vengeance, it's, they, they're, not, they're not vengeful, they just become disordered. They become monstrous. Now, this made sense in the 12th century, but it didn't make sense in the 18th or the 19th century. I think it makes a lot more sense now uh, when we see the elements becoming more monstrous to us because of the ways that we behave unjustly. So Hildegard thinks that there's this realm of purgatory that exists around Earth. And then on this side, there's movement towards blessedness, towards the heavenly Jerusalem, and towards the great star beyond all things, right? towards the kind of eternal light. Uh, and then down at this, at this end, there's the sort of hell mouth. Uh, now let me just read you one more bit before I bring this to a close. The, um, so in the midst of this geography of Felicity, purgation, and perdition. This, this world that, I want to pose a question. Is it, what does it mean that she thinks this is the world? Uh, this, this isn't, she doesn't believe, clearly she doesn't believe that you could get in a, a boat and sail outside of that sort of four-cornered uh, middle ground there, right? But she also believes that those bordering worlds are real and physical. She believes that human pestilence, that, that actual disease wafts into our world from these purgatorial realms that surround it. Uh, and a part, part of the question I have when I think about this is like, where, where is that for her? Because it's not, it's clearly not something that she could traverse. She couldn't find her way to those mountains at the edge of the world. 
but she also believes that it's continuous in some way with the physical and continuous with the psychic. Uh, and I think she believes that absolutely. Uh, and that leaves open a, a sort of ontological question of where that dwells that I think Tolkien might help us answer. In her description of, before she begins to explain this whole, this whole picture, she, begin, she asks the question of why is this darkness? Why is this sort of pestilential aspect to the world? Why does it exist? And she describes it this way. She says, God indeed, who made everything just described, that is the whole world that we saw, the ordered mandala of creation in the beginning. God is the unique life from which all life breathes as from a ray of sun. For he is the fire from which every fire that provides for happiness is kindled as sparks come forth from life. How would it be fitting if nothing alive hewed to this life, and this fire neither warmed nor illumined anything? And how would it seem for no life nor any brilliance to come forth from the Godhead, which was life before all ages? This initial life had no death in it. Whoops. Um, all creation, in Hildegard's account, has its, has its being from God. But then she says, God created certain spirits for great honor. And at their head, he placed a great prince, upon whom they all gazed as one looks upon a lamp in which shines a burning light. For in that prince sparkled their every beauty like precious stones. You know this story. But, every, but his own gaze he turned to the void where he wanted to set up his throne. This is the story of Lucifer that Hildegard's retelling, the greatest, the most glorious of the light bearers. Uh, and he looked to the north where there was nothing because he wanted to set up his own throne. Whenever Hildegard describes this, she talks about the four directions all the time. She's invoking the four directions. And the north is always the direction from which uh, danger or evil or absence comes because the north is that part of the world in which we never see the sun, right? If you're in the northern hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. But for Hildegard, the sun, it never makes its way into the northern hemisphere. So the north is the place of absence. And she pictures the light bearer not wanting to reflect that light back, not wanting to be a mirror, but wanting to just have his own kingdom, have his own place. Uh, wherefore, she says, he was cast forth with every rank as with stubble into the pit of hell, so that it is fall outer darkness and the mouth of hell's pit were established alongside the pit itself. This pit has no dimension, as to the number of the lost angels cannot be counted. This is the sort of gnawing openness, the hell mouth over here, that opens up into a great darkness, a great shadow that's present, and that can't be numbered because it's utterly unintelligible. It's not that it can't be numbered because it's so vast. It's because numbering would imply some intelligibility, some light, and this this darkness that's coming from that end is the refusal of intelligibility, the refusal of light. In the midst of this picture of the angels singing, right, of the mirror of the choirs of angels singing this glorious world of refracted relationship, Hildegard pictures one being that sought to disrupt all of that and to have its own voice, uh, completely alone, apart from all the others. Then she says, for the outer darkness was prepared for him to counter the pretense by which he wished to be like God. The mouth of hell's pit was made for him because of the unlawful discord that he wanted to establish between God's people or God's angels and his own. And the pit of hell itself was prepared for him because of the envy in which he refused in every way to acknowledge the divine. Now, what's extraordinary here and what Hildegard does in this last move, and here I'm wrapping wrapping up my little bit, is Hildegard then goes on to say how, that, that's why this exists, but how is it fixed? Now your standard story for how that's fixed in the Christian West would be, well that's fixed because of Jesus, right? Uh, it, you've all sort of heard that story. Hildegard's answer though is so much more complex. Hildegard says the space that was created by the fall of this choir of angels, the space that was created by the fall of these beings that wanted to establish their own autonomy, their own sort of egoic identity, rather than joining in that great mandala of creation, the space for that is filled up by what she calls the tenth choir of angels. Traditionally, there are nine choirs of angels that are identified, nine sort of ranks of angels. But Hildegard uses this language of the tenth choir and the tenth choir is 
human beings, but human beings in all of creation. So the, the extraordinary story she's telling is a story in which creation itself, all of this, everything that is, is itself reparative, right? So it's not just a story in which there's one sort of individual savior figure that's reparative. It's not a story in which there's a certain group of special people that are repairing the breach. It's rather a story in which everything that exists, all of this, that initial picture she had, the mandala of the world, right? As a, harmo as a harmonious world, all of that exists in order to fill up the space left by the angels that left to follow in a sort of autonomous rebellion. And so they needed to be, the, the, the choir had to be completed, the harmony had to be completed by what she calls the tenth choir. And God surrounded the blessed spirits, she says, with the might of his majesty, no longer to fear any shock of the ancient deceiver. And their faces he filled with his brilliance, so that they might ever delight to gaze upon his face. In this way, he extends his power even over hell, because the ancient deceiver cannot destroy by any war or artifice the full number of those who will join the heavenly harmony. For in the manner of the viper, the deceiver killed himself. One more from Hildegard. She says, humankind is the tenth choir which God repaired within himself upon the original foundation of the fallen angels, because he willed humankind to come into being. And then in their humanity is the tower in which those who walk are in the tenth choir. And God signified in man both the higher and the lower creatures. Uh, remember that, that, that picture of the, the human being as the microcosm. All of, it's all of creation present for it. And the human being was inspired by the breath of life that is the soul. And the human being rose up and learned about all parts of creation. And in his spirit, he embraced them with a the most powerful love. Hildegard's, essentially what she's trying to describe in, in, in these things, and she, she brings it out in, in sort of elaborate detail, but it's extended over many, many pages, is the picture of the human being as embracing the whole of creation in love. Embracing the whole of creation in love and then speaking their names. And that speaking the name of the entire world of creation is what balances out the disharmony, the discord created by the fall of the rebellious angels. It's, it's a picture of the secret fire returned, uh, not by overcoming or uh, erasing what happened, but by completing in a larger sense. When she goes on after this, and I won't take you into it, to, to describe her own reading of the Genesis account of the six days of creation, she starts by saying, in the very beginning, God created two types of matter. He created darkness and light. And the darkness and the light were combined and pictured together. It's a picture of anticipating the disharmony and outflanking it by an ever greater harmony that's established. Uh, and that's the 10th choir. I don't fully know what to make of all of it, but I find it absolutely fascinating. <coughs> So I'm going to take. I'm going to stop at that point. So, as a means of transition between one creation story and another, we wanted to play a piece of music that Hildegard composed, and um, writing music was one of her many, many talents. And just to give you a context for how revolutionary her music was, she was creating these uh, choral pieces for women at a time when uh, most of the religious music was Gregorian chant. And if you're familiar with Gregorian chant, it's uh, typically sung by a choir of men and will kind of hold a note and then move up maybe one note and then maybe down two at most. And Hildegard was writing music that soars across octaves within just a few notes. And this was um, unheard of at the time. So because music is such an important theme in these creation stories, it seemed fitting to bring her own music into this.
so moving forward eight centuries, uh, I want to share the creation myth that was written by J.R.R. Tolkien. And most of you have probably heard of Tolkien as the author of The Lord of the Rings, which he wrote in the late 30s and 40s and published in the mid-1950s. But Tolkien was writing of Middle-earth long before that. And he began to write the first stories of this place that he called Middle-earth beginning in 1914, 15, 16, at the same time that the First World War was raging, so another time of crisis and conflict. And this image is one that he drew in 1912, which depicts this figure stepping off a cliff. It's called the end of the world. And yet, as you can see, it doesn't really look like someone jumping in despair off a cliff. It's someone stepping out into an extraordinary world of beauty, stars and the moon and the sea and the sun. And while we don't have for Tolkien in the way we do from Hildegard, a clear um, description of what, of what the source was of his stories, of his imaginative visions, but we can piece it together and surmise based on his letters, based on these extraordinary illustrations that he made. And I've argued elsewhere that it seems he may have at times been having something along the lines of what we could call visionary experience. And after he had written a few of his first tales of Middle Earth, he sat down to write a creation myth something that would lay out the origin of the world, not only as it would fit the stories that he was bringing forward, but perhaps something that would also be able to hold and explain the level of suffering and loss that he witnessed as a, a soldier in the First World War. At, at the end of the war, he was not only an orphan, his parents had died when he was quite young, but Tolkien had lost all but one of his closest friends. So this is someone who was uh, definitely bereft and uh, had experienced a great deal of loss in his life. And Tolkien did a number of amazing illustrations, but he didn't illustrate this particular creation myth. So I actually found illustrations by a contemporary artist, a woman named uh, Anna uh, Kulitz, and she did these illustrations um, of Tolkien's cosmogony about four years ago uh, that I'll show momentarily. And Tolkien called his creation myth the music of the Ainur, and he later called it the Ainulindale, which is the elvish translation for music of the Ainur. And it begins with the one who is called Eru, the one god who is also known as Iluvatar. And from Eru is emanated these beings that Tolkien calls the Ainur. And this is one of those illustrations. They are the offspring of Iluvatar's thought and he invites them to begin to sing, to begin to create music. And at first they do this one by one or in small groups. And their music is a reflection of Iluvatar's thought. And eventually Iluvatar asks them to bring forward a great music and lays out the theme for this music, but invites them to adorn it with their own creativity, with their own thought and devising. And Iluvatar says, because I have given each of you the secret fire, or the flame imperishable, it's also called, which is the source of being, of being and reality. And so because the Ainur are gifted with the secret fire, they are 
alive. They are, in some sense, independent of Iluvatar. And they have choice. So the Ainur begin to sing. They begin to create this great music. And there are harmonies weaving together in beautiful ways. And then it comes into the heart of one of them, whose name is Melkor, who is the mightiest of all the Ainur, who's given the most gifts of power and majesty and nobility. And it comes to, into his heart to weave themes of his own devising that are not in accordance with the theme of Iluvatar, to weave this into the music. And before the music began, this Ainur, Melkor, had wandered in the darkness of the void. And the void was the outer darkness where Iluvatar had not yet turned the light of his face. So in some ways, we could think of the void as the shadow of Iluvatar. It's what is behind or unseen of the one god. And Melkor is impatient of the void. He wants it to bring forth creativity. <coughs> he wants to be his own creator in the same way that Iluvatar is. And so he takes his experiences of wandering alone in the void and he weaves that into the music. And what happens is discord arises. Disharmony is brought into the music. And the other Ainur begin to falter because this isn't the same theme. They start to tune their music to his. And suddenly there are two conflicting musics playing out around the throne of Iluvatar. So Iluvatar stands up and raises his left hand. And in raising his left hand, a new theme begins and starts to contend with the theme that Iluvatar has brought forth. But they are clashing even more. There is a war of the musics that is raging, like a, a raging storm on the ocean in the halls of Iluvatar. So then Iluvatar stands up again and raises his right hand. And with that, yet another theme of music comes forward. And this theme, it starts slowly and quietly, barely perceptible, but it starts to build and it starts to draw into it the, the additions of the other Ainur. And it seems that both there are two musics playing and yet the most triumphant notes of Melkor's discordant music are taken up by this third theme, which is deep and sorrowful. And that's where its beauty comes from, is from that sorrow. And the, it weaves into itself the most triumphant notes of the discordant music. And so they start to come back together. And then finally, as the music is reaching a peak, Iluvatar stands and with both hands brings the music to a close in a chord that is deeper than the abyss and higher than the firmament and as piercing as the light of the eyes of Iluvatar. And with that chord, everything, the music, comes to a close. And after this music of the Ainur has been played, Iluvatar then shows all of the Ainur a vision. And it is a vision of the world. This is one of Tolkien's illustrations um, of <coughs> the blessed realm, of the two trees of Eleanor. <coughs> and he shows a vision of the world to the Ainur and says, this is what your music has brought forward. It has brought forward this vision of the world. And you can see all of your themes within it. And he turns to Melkor and says, you also will see your themes here. And you should all know that no theme can be played in my despite. 
even if uh, you bring in discord, it actually has its uttermost source in me. So Iluvatar takes responsibility for the discord and says that even that will create things more wonderful, more beautiful than whoever brought the discord in could have imagined. And in that moment, Melkor feels shame. And from that shame comes a secret anger. And I feel like maybe that is the place where, as a good parent, Iluvatar might have made a mistake in shaming that offspring of his thought. Because the discord from that moment sets in as the shame and this anger. And so after the vision that Iluvatar shows to the Ainur, he says, Ea, let these things be. And that's the name of the world in this cosmology. Ea, the world that is. And I think it's significant that it's not the world as it ought to be or as it should be. It's just the world that is. And the Ainur are, fall so deeply in love with this world that many of them commit to entering into it, to build it. And as they see the unfolding of the vision, they realize what that third theme was, the one that was able to weave in the, the discordant notes and make it into a more beautiful but sorrowful theme. And that theme represents the children of Iluvatar. And the children of Iluvatar are elves and human beings, or the Quendi and the Atani, the firstborn and the followers. And it is their addition into creation, which comes from Iluvatar alone, not from any of the other Ainur, but purely from Iluvatar, that is meant to bring the music back in to harmony. And so the, the Ainur commit to enter into the world and they become the powers of the world. And there are four of the greatest Ainur. One is named Ummo, and Ummo is the, the god of water. And of all the elements in the world, the Ainur wondered most at water, this mysterious substance. And it's said that in the sound of water, in the voice of the sea, is the echo of the music of the Ainur. And that's why when we hear the song of the sea, our hearts yearn for something that we don't know what it is but we're being called back through the sound of creation that we hear in the ocean. And then another one of the, the great Valar is named Manwe. And Manwe is the god of the winds and the airs. And it's with delight that Omo and Manwe realize that they can work together as they bring water and air and they're able to create clouds and rain. And even the discord of Melkor, the discord that brought in extremes of heat and cold, can bring forth snow when the extreme of cold meets the water of Olmo. Then we have snow and snowflakes. Um, when the heat evaporates the water into the air, then we have clouds and we have rain. And so all these things that, as individuals, the Ainur couldn't conceive of when they were singing forth air or water, when it all comes together, even with the discord, it does create something ever more beautiful. And then you have another one of the Valar named Aule, who is the god of earth and of crafts and making things. And so you have your four elements here of earth, air, water, and fire represented by these four Ainur. And as the music, in Tolkien's telling of the music of the Ainur, he writes that there has been no greater music, but 
It is said that in the end, when the world has broken and been remade, then there will be a greater music because in that music, the children of Iluvatar will join in and they will sing their own harmonies that bring the world to completion. And it is then that everything that is sung will immediately come into being because then each one of these uh, singers of the new music will have the secret fire that brings life and being. And so the new music will cre recreate the world. The last piece of this creation myth is that there are two different kinds of gifts that were given to the children of Iluvatar. To the Quendi, who are known by innumerable names, but elves is one of them, or gnomes, the Noldor, those who know, or the Quendi, those who speak. They are given the gift of beauty. They are the, f the fairest of all beings, and everything that they create and make brings beauty into the world, and their life is bound to the world itself. So they are, as long as the world lasts, immortal. They live as long as the world does. And there's a very different gift that is given to mortal human beings. In the hearts of human beings, Iluvatar set the desire to seek beyond the world, not to be bound to it, not to be have their life inherently woven into the full length of the life of the world. Rather, human beings seek beyond the world. And they have the capacity, the virtue, to shape their life beyond the powers and chances of the world, beyond the music. So the music is as fate to everything else, to the Valar, to the elves, to plants and animals, to the earth itself. That The music is fate, but human beings are given a special gift, which is to make decisions beyond that fate. And so this entire cosmology plays out as an interaction between fate and free will and what choices humans will make. Now paired with this freedom, this freedom to determine their lives beyond the music, is what is called the gift of Iluvatar. And the gift of Iluvatar is the capacity to leave the world, or what we call death. And this was the, the gift that was given to human beings, that they were called the strangers or the guests by elves who couldn't understand why their lives were so short and that they would then depart. But f with this freedom comes also this gift of death to leave. And the creation myth that Tolkien wrote is told from the perspective of the elves. And so to the elves, it's a mystery. It's a mystery where human <coughs> beings go after the gift of death is given to them and they depart. But it is said in this mythology that after they have died and after the world itself has come to an end, then human beings will join that choir of the Ainur and it is then that they will sing the world into completion. And so in this way, it's very much like the 10th choir that Hildegard was speaking about. So that's the, um, that is the music of the Ainur as expressed by Tolkien. And he, he wrote it down in, in 1919. He reworked it over multiple decades. And yet it always stayed in so much of the phrasing close to what was initially penned in that 1919 telling. It seemed to all come through at once as a whole. And the revisions made later are just minor tweaks here and there, shaping and refining as, as he so often did. But it seemed to 
the gap in, in those years just following the First World War. So, <coughs> just a tiny bit of time to go into dialogue. Yeah. So that, that <laughs> So two, just two fascinating things that I was thinking of while you were talking. One is, as far as we know, Tolkien, even though he was a medievalist and uh, knew a tremendous amount about early medieval Germanic literature, he doesn't seem to have known Hildegard of Bingen, who's out of his normal <coughs> time span, and the similarities don't seem to have come from textual transmission. Um, the second one is when you were talking about the, the difference between the two gifts of the elves and of human beings. Uh, this is something that Hildegard talks about as well. She talks about the, the angels are created, both angels and human beings are created as rational creatures. That is, they have, they have what she calls the insignia of the divine on them because they're, they're capable of being these rational creatures that are able to articulate the world, to bring it to articulation, to creative expression. Uh, and as rational, they have freedom but because they dwell in two different types of temporality, they have two different types of freedom. So the angels dwell in a kind of evu, which is a higher order of time. So their freedom is a freedom that coincides just with their creation. They have freedom in the instant of their being to either be, right, to either fall towards the pit and follow, follow the sort of way of rebellion and autonomy or to join the choir and sing. Whereas human beings, uh, Hildegard says the angels look at human beings with wonder because their freedom is constantly renewed. Uh, and so they, they wonder at us because it's so hard to constantly make choices of freedom and, and for the good, right? We can't just make one choice for the good. I have to make a choice for the good over and over and over and over again. But they also wonder at it because that's so powerfully creative and produces such a different quality of goodness that's then added to the world that's part of the completion of the 10th choir. Uh. In uh, Tolkien's telling, the he writes that human beings, from the perspective of the, um, the Valar, the Ainur, human beings most resemble Melkor, the one who brought yeah. discord, the one who chose <laughs> to turn away from the theme of Iluvatar. And so they most resemble him and uh, often bring our sorrow to, uh, to Iluvatar because of that. And yet it is in their free choice to choose the way of discord or to choose the way of harmony that is really their essence, what makes them um, unique and essential to creation. Mm -hmm. the, the the, the other big question I, I have about all of this, and, and that the, I'm fascinated by these resonances, uh, and they seem to be resonances that are not mediated by textual continuities. Uh, I'm not only fascinated by, say, the archetypal convergence there, but also by the expressive response to both of them, right? With both Hildegard and Tolkien, it seems like you have a vision of the human being, the tenth choir, the the let's call it the creative artistic task of the human being in relationship to the rest of creation. Right, a creative artisanal relationship to creation seems to fill out the harmony that would otherwise be broken, and both of them respond to it through this complex process of mythopoesis and artistic expression, right? For Hildegard in music and painting and drama, for Tolkien and this entire <coughs> world building and, and fantasy. Yeah. 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 Solve that for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well I I'm just thinking of something that Tolkien would say almost I think in defense of his uh, writing of fantasy, his articulation of other worlds. And that he felt, th there's this quote that I just love uh, that he says, fantasy is and remains a human right. We make in our, um, no, I'm forgetting it, uh, we make in our 
measure because we are made and mm. made in the likeness and image of a maker. Mm. And Tolkien felt that our artistic ability, our creative mm. ability, especially in something like uh, fantasy or world building, it actually led to the further efflorescence of creation. It's carrying forward creation itself by creating or bringing forward other worlds. And so he really saw that as doing God's work yeah. in a way, bringing that forward. Can, can we flip back to that, that one picture that I was dwelling on um, a little bit, the dark one? Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of, you can see a lot of sort of womb-like pictures in some of these. Um, this one, uh, actually one more there. This, this one, Bennett pointed out to me in class that this looks a lot like a birth process uh, and heading that direction, right? Um, and when you were describing the, the, the aim of mortals, of human beings, towards something beyond uh, the earth, mm -hmm. uh, it made me think of this where there's this movement through, through the sort of blessed realm of earth toward this road that leads to the heavenly Jerusalem to the great sun of, of at the center there, and then to this tower and beyond to the stars, right? And all of that is, is a picture, in a sense, out of this, this Middle Earth. And it made me think that, that this Middle Earth, what I was calling Middle Earth here, this, this center that we dwell, is for Hildegard not just, it's not just physical, and it's not just physical and psychic, it's the whole sort of imaginal conception that it seems like for her what's alive is a world that's not just this one that I can touch and capture on that camera but a world that's filled with all of these stories and songs and memories and that's the whole world and it's that complex that integral complex of psyche and cosmos imagination and spirit all of our struggles over justice etc that's moving towards something uh, that's being that's in a birth process along with our own creative expressions, uh, and you're telling of you're telling of while you were retelling Tolkien's Ayunin Ayunlandali Ayunlandali I shouldn't try to say that while you were telling that it just made me think that something similar is going on with Tolkien like Leaf by Nigel or mm -hmm. something like mm -hmm. that. I, one thing too that I find really interesting that Tolkien felt was necessary in his creation story is that there are two children of Luthatar and they're given such radically different gifts that the the firstborn the elves are bound to this world but they bring the beauty into the world and mm. when we think about these kind of they are almost like angelic figures and so uh, from the human perspective the yeah. elves have this kind of spiritual uh, beyond this world quality and yet looking at their creation actually they are more of this world than human beings are yeah. and it's the their views on each other how the immortal views the mortal and envies the gift of death and how the mortal views the immortal and envies that gift of seemingly eternal life mm. and that both are needed mm -hmm. in the, that co-creation process of making the world more beautiful, of healing its hurts. Mm -hmm. um, the elves are oriented toward the past, towards slowing down time, toward preservation, because their whole existence is bound to this world. Whereas for human <coughs> beings, it's more oriented toward the future. and. Um, the creation coming out of the world. Um, and that dichotomy <coughs> Tolkien brought in with two actual different species of people uh, to try and illustrate it. She says, both. she says something really similar about the angels. She says there are, there, there are angels that we know nothing of, that you only, the only way you, anyone would know anything about them is if in the, in the light of the living light, you know, in, in seeing things in the living light itself, you were shown that they exist. Uh, but then she says there's other angels who are turned towards this world, towards 
you and me and all of creation and plants and cosmos and uh, the, the winds and the waters and all you know, the whole world of meteorology for her, which is really exciting for her. And uh, those angels are constantly focused just on that. It's that same picture of almost being, being wedded to the governance of the earth, the, uh, the service of the earth. Uh, and then I, but I never thought of it as that, as human beings crisscrossing uh, that the, the sort of eternity of being focused upon the preservation of the earth and the, the, the tension of striving towards being born of the earth and then beyond just what is now. Uh, it's extraordinary. Both are, and you see this in her concept of veriditas too, that uh, these are not just up and out cosmologies. Right. They're so intimately connected with the imminent and that the most angelic beings, their life is actually completely committed to the world uh, mm -hmm. as long as it will last. Mm -hmm. um, well, in terms of ongoing dialogue, I had so many different thoughts mm -hmm. as you were speaking of numerous other parallels, but maybe we can take um, comments and questions after since we are at dinner time and bring it to an official close. Sounds good. Thank you.